All right, NFL training camp is fully underway. Fast-paced, up-tempo, we're here. And this is the first real news and on-field action we are getting. Uh, we listen to, you know, draft stuff, and we listen to all this off-season chatter for four or five months at a time. And then we finally get some real news from beat reporters, and we can start to paint the picture of what depth charts look like, who are the starters, who are going to be the impact players for the year. So right now, based on all the training camp reports over the last week or so, we're going to talk about players moving drastically up or down my rankings right now. And some of them are moving just because of news. Some of them are moving because of injuries or just more research that I've done as we've been working hard on the draft guide that just released. So the first player that has been moving up my rankings and really no doing of his own, but the lack of doing from the criminal justice system and the NFL is Rashi Rice, the Kansas City Chief wide receiver. While Hollywood and Xavier Worthy are, you know, experiencing all these training camp clips and and highlights and stuff like that, I barely drafted any Rashi Rice uh, on underdog from pretty much May to July. I thought that the further we were out, the riskier it was to draft him at his price, whatever it was, whether it was fourth round at the beginning of the offseason, all the way down to like the seventh round when we got into about mid-June. But now into August, with each day that passes by, it feels less and less likely that we'll have an outcome, a decision, or a suspension this season. Now, obviously, I could be very wrong here, but I'm just playing the odds. Like I said, the further out we were with the Rashi Rice ordeal, the more uncertainty, the more time in which all this can happen, and the closer we are to the season, vice versa. The Chiefs also, they're just not the type of team to self-discipline their players. They're going for the three-peat, all right? And I don't think that involves taking one of, if not their best pass catcher at this point, and sitting him on the bench. So again, with, with each passing day, it kind of feels like he is moving up a spot in my rankings, right? We might get something mid-season. We might get something pushed all the way until next season. And it feels like the closer we get, the more likely that is the outcome. So Rashi Rice is moving further and further up in my rankings again, available in the draft guide right now. The next duo of receivers moving drastically up my charts are the Patriots groupings of Jalen Polk and Pop Douglas. This is a DM that I got from a beat reporter that is a part of the Patriots. To feed into any Pop Douglas hype you might have, he has had his most active day of camp today coming back from a hand injury, and coincidentally, today was the offense's best day of the summer. He adds a different explosive element to the offense and such a pain to deal with that it's opened up other areas of the offense for the other receivers. I hit him back. I said, probably won't run in two wide receiver sets, right, because Pop's a smaller player. I'm thinking he'll probably just be a slot-only receiver, which obviously caps his upside, sort of like a Jaden Reed. Then I asked Jalen Polk. He's doing well, right? Uh, the beat reporter followed up. He said he'll be in some packages, but yeah, it would mostly be Bourne and Polk, I'm assuming. So this is kind of where, you know, listen, I think the most valuable information that you can get this time of the year is not listening to fantasy people, listening to people that are actually at the training camps, listening to real beat reporters that are seeing what's happening on the field. However, you need to start to distinguish. This is where fantasy could play a role in the fact that, like, he's saying it'll be Kendrick Bourne and Jalen Polk. That feels more like where we need to jump in, and, and I'm thinking, okay, Kendrick Bourne tore his ACL and very likely not going to be a factor this year in two wide receiver sets kind of thing. So that's where I jump in and say, okay, if he's the best receiver when Kendrick Bourne's not on the field and he's starting in two wide receiver sets, that means Polk might be the number one there. He said Polk's been doing well and has been their best receiver with Bourne and Douglas out. He kind of reminds me of a more explosive Jacoby Myers when he was here. And that was actually the exact comp that Brett Coleman gave to Polk when we did our rookie episode together. He'll come away with anything in his catch radius. And basically with that being said, my comp for him was a high end of T Higgins. And as Flash exceptional route running, he's building up a lot of chemistry with Brissett and Drake May. Now, there's a lot of reports coming out, but I will say this is the same exact dude from last summer that hit me with the news about Zeke. If you remember last year, if you were following my videos last summer, I was really high on Ramondre Stevenson in July. Uh, and then I got the warning shot from my man over here telling me that the Pats were probably about to sign Ezekiel Elliott. And then I cooled off pretty tremendously for that. Now, this isn't the only thing that I am looking at or reading into i was very high on jalen polk coming into the draft as a prospect he got second round capital pop douglas was a bit of a revelation last year the patriots don't have any sort of explosion in that offense and when you look at their roles right like they don't have Devontae parker anymore they literally just have like kj osborne these rookies uh kendrick Bourne coming back from the acl so when you look at jalen polk's build and the type of player he is 
They need a perimeter player. They need a dude who's 6'1", 6'2", 210 pounds. They need a slot wide receiver like Pop Douglas. So these guys fit so well into this role. And for the thousandth time this offseason, you have to leave room for these offenses to not be the exact same offense that they were last year. It is quite literally, legally, and physically not the same offense that it was last year. Like, you can't expect the same results when they have a new quarterback, a new coach, a new offensive coordinator, a new scheme. Like, this is how offenses change. And I'm not saying it's going to work, but I'm saying you're playing the odds right now that it's not going to be as bad as last year, and you're drafting these guys as if we know for certain that they're going to put up 14 points a game again like they did last year. Like, come on now. Who else? Who else out here on Fantasy YouTube is giving you fucking straight beat reporter DMs? Speaking of that, I'm actually about to do an episode where I'm interviewing beat reporters from multiple camps. Uh, one from the Patriots, not this one, a different Evan Lazar, who's a very renowned beat reporter, uh, someone from Steelers camp. I'm trying to get in, in touch with other camp beat reporters like uh, Jimmy Kemsky from Philly and those types of dudes to try to get a little bit more in the know as it relates to some of the, the, the burning questions around fantasy this year. As we continue down the players, we've got Rashi Rice, we've got Jalen Polk, we've got Pop Douglas. I think we should all be drafting more of them. My favorite, favorite, favorite tight end this year being drafted outside of the top 12 is by far and away Pat Fryermuth of the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, I've ton of, I've talked a ton about the Steelers offense already because I'm kind of in love with Najee Harris and Jalen Warren and George Pickens and just the fact that this offense is really condensed. But what makes me excited about Pat Fryermuth in particular is that their offensive line is so, so upgraded, right? They've used back-to-back -back firsts on their offensive line. This year, they use their first, second, and fourth round pick on offensive line. And you look at Arthur Smith coming over. Arthur Smith was the Falcons head coach last year. They used the single most two tight end sets in the NFL last year. The offense in Pittsburgh is super similar to uh, what the offense was in Atlanta last year, where they're going to use two tight end sets at a super, super high rate. And that's going to be Darnell Washington and Pat Fryermuth. And guess what? With an improved offensive line and a beast like Darnell Washington on the offensive line, playing basically as a sixth offensive lineman, Pat Fryermuth is going to run routes on basically 95% of their dropbacks. I was listening to uh, a podcast called the Simple Handicap Podcast the other day. Uh, they had a beat reporter from Pittsburgh come out, and he said if he was laying money down, he would easily say George Pickens is the top most targeted player in this offense, followed very closely by Pat Fryermuth, all right? Everything out of camp has been raving about Pat Fryermuth. Deontay Johnson is gone, so there goes like 140 targets a year out of the offense and needing to be picked up and more accurate targets because it's Russell Wilson and not Kenny Pickett. Uh, and, and Pat is coming off of like an injury plague season, obviously. But if you look at his 2022 numbers, he had 63 catches, 732 yards, average 11.2 yards per reception. He had the third most deep targets among all tight ends. He had the fourth most unrealized air yards. So you're talking about shots downfield that did not end up becoming catches. That is a lot of opportunity there. And just seventh overall in yards per route run. He was legitimately very, very good in 2022. I think we're in for a very strong bounce back for uh, Pat Firemuth in 2024. Moving on to the next player, we have Tony Pollard of the Tennessee Titans. Now, this has been a name that like, I, I don't feel like I've heard a lot of chatter about. I don't feel like I've heard a lot of optimism about, but I am becoming more and more into the strategy of grabbing a hero running back at the top of the first round, grabbing your Bijan, Brees Hall, JT, whoever you want up there, and then getting Tony Pollard in like the eighth or ninth round as your running back two. Pollard signs a nice deal in Tennessee to be the starter there. Like they gave him starter money. And listen, I know that him and Tajay Spears were listed as co-starters on the first depth chart. And I kind of believe that. I think they'll both get a shit ton of run. But this offense, I think, is going to scheme way more towards the strengths of these two, where it's going to be up-tempo and they're going to run a shitload of plays because they have Brian Callahan coming over from Cincinnati. They're going to be very pass-heavy. DeAndre Hopkins just got hurt, so more targets to the running backs most likely. What I think is going to happen is they're going to split work, obviously. Uh, I think Tony Pollard will very likely be the goal line back there, and that's obviously significant. I could see Pollard scoring 8, 9, 10 touchdowns, which will easily return value on his running back 29 price. I think I have him all the way up at running back 23 or four in my rankings. I think we're going to get 230 to 250 touches out of Pollard. And I think a lot of them are going to be valuable goal line and pass catching work here. Now here's, here's what like got me really excited. If you follow Nathan Janke of PFF, he does some like really great breakdowns, analytical breakdowns and goes really deep on specific players and stuff. What we found from Pollard last year is he had the fractured leg in 2022 came into 2023 clearly was not himself right he broke his fibula fucked up his ankle in the playoffs the year prior uh he came out and he said he wasn't quite healthy in 2023 until about week 10 or 11. 
Now, this is the stat from Nathan Janke of PFF. He said, from week 11 until the end of the season, Pollard had a league-leading 90.8 PFF rushing grade, 4.2 yards per attempt, 3.3 yards after contact per attempt, 0.28 avoided tackles per attempt, and a 24% first down rate. His 92.3 PFF rushing grade over the past three seasons is the top mark among all running backs who have played more than one season in that time span. All right, so last year's borderline first round price for Pollard was fucking insane, but this year you're drafting him in the eighth or ninth round, and I think his floor is really high, and I think his ceiling might be higher than we're giving him credit for. I think the injury clearly played a lot more of a role than we expected it to last year, and once he was healthy, he played really, really well down the stretch. And kind of just going off of that same beat with the Tennessee wide receiver group, Calvin Ridley, right? Like last week, he was uh, on a list I made of players that I'm avoiding in fantasy football. But if you know me, you know that one of my pillars in fantasy football is fading injury optimism. So the fact that DeAndre Hopkins got hurt, the fact that he got hurt in August and he's on a four to six week timetable pretty much completely pushes me off any sort of DeAndre Hopkins draft capital. I will not be drafting him. And like I said, we can't predict injuries, but if a player enters the season at less than 100%, he's far more likely to get hurt. D-Hop's probably going to try to push his way back onto the field before he's ready, and he might be less than 100%. This might be an injury that lingers. This might be uh, a knee sprain that he tweaks and misses more time. So with the DeAndre Hopkins news, Calvin Ridley has to skyrocket up rankings. There there ain't no way about it. Same thing with Mr. Cooper Cup, right? Uh, Puka got hurt and he is week to week with a knee injury. Now, again, there are reports that this feels less significant than the D-Hop injury. Like D-Hop's injury happened and they immediately came out and said four to six weeks. Where Puka, it said week to week uh, and there was a report that said it was not a serious injury. So they might just be taking their time with him. Regardless, in the same way that we shoved Cooper Cup down the rankings last offseason when everyone else was still like, no, nah, he's a first round pick, fucked up his hamstring in late August. We were like, you can't take him before the third or fourth round. We are going to wait on more news from Puka, but he might get that treatment as well. It is early in August, so we've got about a full month before the season starts. But I want to see a full week of practice from Puka running at full speed before the season starts for me to feel comfortable drafting him. And if that's not the case, Cooper Cup has reportedly looked great at training camp and he's got to become pretty much a top 12 receiver in fantasy rankings now. The last dude that is skyrocketing up my rankings right now is Andre Yosevas. Yosevas. Am I ever going to get that right? Yosevas. Uh, he is the third wide receiver on the Cincinnati Bengals depth chart. I, I low-key feel like the Bengals are building a similar, better version of what the Packers have in that they have the depth of like five really high quality wide receivers that they could use interchangeably and kind of move in the slot, outside, all over the field, and they're all going to be really, really good. Uh, Obviously, Chase and Higgins run laps around Watson and Jaden Reed as the top two guys. Then there's probably a little bit of a drop-off, but between Andre Yosevas, I'm never going to, fuck, Andre uh, Andre Ilyasova, Andre Iguodala, Jermaine Burton, and Charlie Jones, I think they're all high-quality backup players, but it seems like Andre has the... Uh, Upper hand is wide receiver three, though. I think him and Burton are going to split time a little bit, but I'm interested in whoever the wide receiver three is in this offense. On the flip side, uh, some players moving down my rankings a little bit. Actually, Jaden Reed of the Green Bay wide receiver group. His his ADP has gotten really high on underdog, right? He's like a fifth round pick at this point. And I just think the offense is way too spread out. I, I don't even think there's going to be a receiver that plays more than 80% of the snaps this year. It's a good problem to have for real football, but I'm kind of off of most of these guys in fantasy. And I know you said, how can you penalize the Packers after you said it's a good thing for the Bengals? It's because the Bengals receivers are like 16th, 17th, 18th round picks, where the Packers receivers are 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th round picks. So the cost is way higher. They're probably a little bit of better players, but when I look at the interchangeableness of the Packers receiver room, it's going to be really hard to predict who plays well. You see so many stats thrown around of like when these three are on the field or when these four are on the field, the yards per target per route run per fucking adjusted yards per attempt goes slightly in favor of Christian Watson over Dontavian Wicks. And it just gets like out of control where people are stretching really hard to figure out what's going to be the right thing there. So to reach on players, high quality players, love Jaden Reed, but 
to reach into such an uncertain situation, it's like you're putting your hand in a in a grab bag. We're like, you might come up with a chocolate bar. You might get bit by a fucking tarantula. So I, I'm i I'm hesitant. Listen, this is not like a complete fade list. These are just guys slowly moving down my rankings, just becoming more in touch with how I'm feeling about these dudes, if that makes sense. But we do have the entire all fade list up on the draft guide right now, which is available for purchase on BDGE. Dot co, all right, and the cheapest way you can get it, it is full price on our website, bdg.co. But the cheapest way to get it is by going to underdogfantasy.com or just downloading the app in the app store, uh, Underdog Fantasy. And when you deposit ten dollars or more, that's it. So a huge discount based on what the full price is ten dollars or more with the promo code BDGE. You're going to get the draft guide emailed to you absolutely free. You are going to get a deposit match on underdog so that you can come draft with us and you can hit the pick'em slips and you're going to get a free square of 0.5 passing yards for lamar jackson in week one how you doing all right so based on that obviously as i said uh deandre hopkins is moving down significantly in my rankings four to six weeks out uh he's already an older player which is like the woke cocktail it's like putting orange juice in a margarita those two combined old injury just i i ain't having it right now okay so So continue to follow along, subscribe to the channel if you're new, because we'll be doing an updated version of this video after every weekend of preseason games. Okay, so preseason really kicks off this Thursday. We'll be tracking it very closely in the draft guide. You will get uh, in-depth write-ups of every single game and what is fantasy relevant that you need to know for your drafts. But then I will make like a recap video of it on the channel. All right. So you can get it for free. You can get it for paid if you like the more in-depth stuff. But all of our rankings are available right now. PPR, standard, half PPR, super flex, one quarterback up in the draft guide. Uh, I love y'all. I'm out of here. Smoochies.